Oh, I don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want to hurt their movie. <laughs> Welcome to Real History. I'm host Jared Frederick, and I'm pleased to introduce a series of special new episodes. I recently co-authored a book with pilot John Homan, who served as a lieutenant in the 489th Bomb Group during World War II. You can find the link to our book, Into the Cold Blue, via the link below. In the meantime, hit that subscribe button and enjoy John's unique insider commentary from his first time watching the miniseries, Masters of the Air. This is the vault. And I've been hit. I'm coming down to you, Duvall. Well, in, in the plane, everybody wore mic, uh, throat mic and earphones. And only the, the pilot flying the plane was on a radio station outside the plane. The one not flying the plane was on the intercom to check on the, the crew periodically. Hell of a crosswind. Gusts increasing, fellas. Be careful. Might want to circle around, Major. Welcome to Greenland. It was a very smooth flight. We took off at dusk and went through a layer, saw some ice flows, then we went through a layer of clouds and we got, we got between two layers. Since we didn't have enough oxygen to go above 10,000 and go all the way across, we picked an altitude around 8,000. And uh, it was between two layers of clouds. And it, we very seldom saw any stars, too. So we trimmed the plane as, as close as we could and put it on autopilot and had the plane fly itself. And that, we did that, and the navigator gave us maybe just a couple of corrections the whole time. And all we did is tweak the, tweak the autopilot. But we stayed in the cockpit for 14 hours without getting up. And we went to a place and just had some rest. And from there, we went to a, 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 a depot where they sent us different directions. And the first thing I did was that they, they served beer uh, with a sand floor. And I got my mess kit, and I got a beer, and I took one sip of their mild and I spit it out. <laughs> Shutting off electrical and recycling it. Let's fix this. It's got to be one of the control circuits. Well, if you examine a B-17, you see it was an extended DC-3. That was the, probably the best and longest lasting plane ever built, the DC-3. It had uh, low wings, and, they, and for a bomber, they just extended the fuselage and put four engines on it. It was a very sturdy plane, undoubtedly. It had a different wing design than the B-24, which had allowed it to fly at 28,000 feet, where the wing design was a new one on a B-24, and it was only good for about 20,000 feet. But it allowed a, longer, a larger bomb load and a longer range. Really farm country. It almost leaves uh, like living in Illinois, where they have three cities in the center of the city, the center of the state, 30, 40 miles apart. Well, East Anglia is really a farm country. Only a few cities, Norwich and Ipswich and Lowestoft. So you were really in a rural area. We had no fence around the base. Just Country roads going through it with an MP at each station. We never had to do that, but I, I think what you would want to do is, is uh, make sure everybody's out of their turrets and sitting in a place bracing themselves. If you could, they had an emergency field in England that had 5,000 gas overshoots. Your best bet is to go there. If you have to land on a runway, there's no preparation other than to try to make a nice, tight, land, smooth landing. You had a total blackout. And 
even the Nissan huts had all the windows shuttered and the double door. And when you went to the John, the John was blocked out. You got up and there are other people in the in the Nissan hut that were still sleeping. They may have flown a mission that day. So you just did it as quietly as you could, just get up, get dressed. Almost like a routine. If your name was up on the board to fly the next day, uh, you hit the sack kind of early. And believe it or not, you slept. And when they came in, they woke you up, and that was it. No, no fuss, no mess. Yeah, that was fairly standard. You went down into a big nest hut, a big nest building. And after everybody was in, they closed the door, and an armed MP, nobody else was allowed in. And the various disciplines got up and talked. They put a curtain back and it showed a red line showing where you're going in and red line where you're coming out. And one person talked about the target and another person talked about what hazards you might be, you know, flak hazards. Uh, one person may talk about the importance of the target. And since the Germans moved flak around on rail cars at night, they couldn't tell where all they are, but they tried to. Once you were briefed, you went to the unit, uh, to the, the uh, well, I'm a fly like an angel today, not die like equipment me. room. And there you were issued, a, we had a hel steel helmets, electric flying suits that you plug to your clubs and socks into. They had a, a May West. You had a flak vest and they had a, uh, Escape kit they gave you with, if you had to bail out, they had an escape kit with maps and morphine and, uh, to, you know, if you could survive, if you survived the jump, then you could use that. I trust you all to remember your training and know your jobs. I think we just had a cap, like a wool cap, and then we put the uh, helmet on top of it. And then you put your... The helmet was beat out because you had earmuffs, ear, earphones on it. You put the earphones on, you put your hat on, and then you put your helmet on. But we didn't have any of those 20 mission crush hats. <laughs> it didn't seem scary at first. All you saw were black puffs. And then when something hit and put a hole in you, you knew it was scary. <laughs> and you, you could see it. When you're going through a flak barrage, if you see what, just the black smoke, that's okay. But when you see the red center of the explosion, that's getting pretty close. Please. No. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Some coffee, Major? John, some coffee. Miss Charity? Give me that. You're welcome. Uh, when you went to the debriefing table, which is as soon as you landed, they took you to, by truck to intelligence debriefing. And on the table was a bottle of whiskey. You could take a drink if you wanted it or not. I tried the first time, and that's the only time I did it because I was too keyed up to have a drink. But every five missions, the Air Force gave the four people on the officers out of the crew a bottle. And they gave the six enlisted men a bottle. But we never drank before mission. That, I can tell you that. Hang in there, bosser. We're gonna send you to Redgrave Hospital. Get you all fixed up. Uh, Can't wait to get back in the fight, sir. Long, our tail gunner had a electric suit short out, and he never said a word, and he was damn near frozen to death when he landed. But he survived nothing, no serious problem. Corporal Ken Lemons was one of our best crew chiefs. He was 19 years old. Uh, our crew chief was a ex-high school principal, and I got to know him fairly well. He was when he joined the army. He of course wanted to put him in a training group as an instructor. He said, "No, I want to do something new because it's the only chance I'll have." So he went to crew chief school, and he a crew chief had three or four people working for him, and he was responsible for maintaining two or three airplanes. And we had a good one, he was great. 
very conscientious. And those poor guys, if you came back, shot up, why? They worked all night long trying to get ready for the next day. When I finished my missions, I had a little time and went down to the club, and they were having a crap game on the pool table. So just for the hell of it, I got in. I used to shoot crap when I was a kid, so I knew how to do it. Uh, so I got in the game, and I had a system where I, if you make a pass, you, you uh, take some money off the table, so you're always playing with somebody else's money. And I stayed there for a while, and I wound up with, uh, I think it was 400 pounds. And a pound was worth $4 and some 25 cents. So I think I came more, more than $1,000, and I put that in my pocket, and that's where I stayed till I got home. It's a question of philosophies. We bomb at night because it doesn't matter what we hit, as long as it's German. But bombing during the day is suicide. Uh, they had different bases. They were far away. They were probably in London the same time I was, but I never saw them. I saw more WAFs, the British uh, women, uh, on trains and so forth uh, than the men. My first time in the lead. Now yeah, well, I've seen bubbles do it a million times. Can't be that hard. We had an exceptionally good navigator. Very conscientious, very smart. When we were going overseas, he only had about two shots at stars and put us right on Prestwick after a 14-mile flight. And he didn't have any good navigation equipment then. He didn't have RAN or uh, radar or anything. He had to do all dead reckoning. So when we were on a mission, our navigator used to be very good in tracking exactly where we were in case we had to leave the formation and go home. In fact, on one mission, the lead navigator got, uh, got it wrong and we were going over the Roar Valley. We weren't even supposed to be there and getting the shot, hell shot out of his flak. So he called up and, uh, to us and asked if he could do his code and call the lead plane and tell him where he was. <laughs> And he did, and they made a correction. And our lead navigator was promoted <laughs> to a lead navigator. I, I mean, our navigator was promoted to a lead navigator. You didn't hear any because you had earmuffs on uh, for, for your hearing. Uh, your intercom and the radio. I, I used to see the flak burst, but I never heard it. Uh, I, I never heard any. There was no battle sounds. Now, in uh, one of the missions we had to help the troops break out of Normandy, we were going in at 10,000 feet, and the ship in front of us got hit square. With it with an 88 and it just flew apart. Now, we heard some pieces f fly off our plane. That was about it. I remember before I went into service, we used to listen to what Fred and Clark uh, every Saturday night, big band, played the best music. And then we saw Glenn Miller overseas. We went to London one time. I went to Covent Gardens where they had a big band and dancing. And that, other than that's all, we didn't have radios or listen to music. You got one lap of the officer's mess, two laps of the enlisted men's mess. When you hear the starter pistol, go! Some of the people on base owned bicycles to get around because there was a total blackout and cab system was very slow. So if they wanted to go into town, they used a bicycle. Uh, I borrowed one once from this fellow Bouchard and went to the town of Beckles and had a few beers and started back in a, in a blackout. I couldn't see anything. And I ran right into a bobby. I mean, I hit him. And he took the bicycle and took me to the police station and called a truck and got me back. And he kept the bicycle. <laughs> Shelters hold maybe 20 people, covered with dirt. Uh, I don't think we ever used them.
I never did. At part of at the end of the war, when the Allies were capturing the buzz bomb sites, they put buzz bombs on airplanes and went north of our base and released them to hit London. And then the English put the forty millimeter radar controlled guns and we just stand on top of the bomb shelters watching them pop them off. I don't remember any chatter even from plane to plane or in the plane. It was all business. Like, you know, you only talked when you had to. And that wasn't very often. That's about the main thing. Oh, the dress was wrong too, because they were wearing regular military hats like we had on the street. You didn't wear those in combat. And you didn't talk to other people because you had a, you had your face mask on for uh, oxygen and you had a throat mic and you had to push a button to talk. And they couldn't yell at each other without doing that. It probably showed the intensity of air warfare. Uh, where you have fighters coming in and flak. I shared that pretty good, I think. Straighten up and fly right. Thanks for watching. <laughs>